Good morning. Welcome to Historic Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in the heart of downtown San Jose. My name is Julia, and I have the privilege of serving as dean of this Episcopal Cathedral community. And in that capacity, I want you to know that there is a place for you at God's table. And now, as we enter into the worship of God, I invite you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, on this day, you open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven, living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed <laughs> and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The name of the one holy and living God. Amen. Am I delusional? <laughs> A member of the Trinity community recently asked me this, and you know, it's the special privilege, and I do mean privilege, of a pastor. People come to me and tell me extraordinary stories of grace and providence, and then wonder if it could really be true, if God could really allow such wonderful things to happen on our earthly plane. You probably have had a few experiences like that yourself. Something is provided just when you need it. A word of comfort is spoken. A broken relationship is healed. Or something just clicks into place when you least expected it. And for that moment, you know that all is well. And you might even think in eternal terms that all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well as the mystic Julian of Norwich wrote in the 14th century. You are amazed and astonished. You thank God. 
Please do thank God. And then you wake up the next morning to the usual stresses and sadness of life and wonder, am I delusional? Are they drunk? That's the question the devout Jews in Jerusalem asked of the disciples who were speaking in other languages. Our Acts reading from this morning teaches us, as the Spirit gave them ability. Well, some of them asked if they were drunk, and Peter responded in a way that sounds fairly humorous in hindsight, that they couldn't be drunk because it was only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, I have no idea, I had no idea that the temporal rules around drinking were so strict in first century Jerusalem. So was Peter being sarcastic? Or was he actually having to push back against the idea that if the disciples had started speaking in tongues at 5 p.m., it might just have been the alcohol talking through them? Others, others though, they were amazed and astonished. And that's where I want to linger for a moment. I want to linger with that statement because it's actually rather hard to linger with amazement and astonishment. Speaking for myself, I'm quick to look for an empirical explanation for whatever apparently miraculous event I might have witnessed, and then move on. Even, even when it was something wonderful, like hearing myself told a story of love in a language I know and love best, I still find myself wanting to blame it on someone else's substance abuse or my own delusions. It is actually pretty hard to stay present to a miracle we can't explain. Our scriptures tell us otherwise, though. Whatever else our Old and New Testaments may be for us, they are a record of God's deeds of power, the grand ones like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also the ones that seem like no more than the reassurance of a still small voice. Our ancestors knew that extraordinary things happened, and even though they were surely as uncomfortable as we were about them, they felt that it was critically important to record them so that we might know about them too. Now, none of us here were present when those frightened disciples suddenly found their courage and their voice. But I like to think that the generations of biblical translators who've rendered these stories we hear every Sunday in languages that we can speak and read and hear now, that they are also disciples on fire. Really, you don't need to look any further than BibleGateway.com to experience your own Pentecost event. On that website, you'll find the scriptures readily available in all the languages you can ever hope to understand, including the original Hebrew and Greek. Honestly, that's a miracle. And what I've learned from comparing translations of our Acts passage is that it's about more than a miracle of tongues. A miracle, you would say, of the spoken word. It's a miracle of having ears to hear that word. As the message translation has it, then when they had heard one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were blown away. A timely image for Pentecost, no? Maybe that's how we know we are close to the spirit of God. We see, hear, taste a thing. And we feel utterly blown away. You know, when I was a small child, my father was an amateur pilot. I've told you about him before. He was an astrophysicist and a student of all things heavenly. And it was, in a way, his very own empirical path towards astonishment and amazement. But as a pilot of a very small plane, he had to keep an eye on such earthly things as the direction of the wind. So one of my favorite jobs at the tiny rural airstrips he often took off from was to watch the windsock. Have you ever seen one? It's a pretty simple technology, a slightly conical tube of fabric, usually with orange and white stripes along its body that help you measure wind speed 
and it's mounted on a pole. Now, because I was young, I was entirely amazed and astonished that so much critical information could be gleaned from the direction and the extension of a fabric tube. It was magical. It was miraculous. When the windsock was blown away, so was I. Since then, I've learned the empirical explanation for how a windsock works. And I'm not quite as excited when I see one, which is honestly kind of a shame. Because for somebody you know, somebody I know, a windsock is still a miracle. The ability to read and retell ancient stories in a variety of contemporary languages is still a miracle too. A still small voice, a timely call from a friend, a, a moment of synchronicity. These are not delusions or drunkenness. They are very real lenses into eternity, woven into the fabric of human existence and reminding us that our lives are part of an even more beautiful tapestry that we see only in part right now. Let's name these moments of existential clarity without shame or self-doubt as the miracles that they are. You know, our Eastertide readings have been all about these lenses into eternity, times when the risen Christ has shown up in all manner of weird and wondrous ways in the guise of a gardener on the road to Emmaus, appearing in locked rooms, eating fish on the beach, and often in forms that were unrecognizable at first. Now, in our polite Episcopal circles, few of us actually want to talk about the weird things we experience in our own time. It would be so much easier, no, and likely much more believable to write them off as delusions or drunkenness, but the spirit of Pentecost teaches us otherwise. These are our stories of God with us, friends, and they can only be told by us. Because I assure you, there is someone among your circle of friends who will only hear the good news when it's spoken through your voice and in your language. You know, Pentecost is also one of four feast days traditionally appointed for public baptisms in the Episcopal Church. A number of children will be baptized at Trinity's Spanish language service today, and still other young people will receive their first communion. And as part of the ritual, they or their parents and all of you who witness the rites will once again promise to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ. That's the legacy of Pentecost. And there's a reason why we re revisit this vow with regularity. It's, it's not just a vow about saying something weird or countercultural. It's about loving our hearers enough to speak of God in a tongue they can understand. You know, you don't need a theology degree or permission from Moses to speak of God's deeds of power. In fact, if you think you're the wrong person to speak up, then it's likely that you're probably just the right person. God seems to prefer it that way. If you are Eldad and Medad preaching outside of the authorized tent of meeting, then you are the right person to speak to the outsiders. If you are only just now learning English, then you are the right person to tell the rest of us how to be a community of welcome and inclusion. If you are a person of color or a gender queer person or a person who is poor or disabled, then you are the right person to tell the story of your struggle and your survival by the grace of God. Don't let anyone else define or limit your truth. Because what you have to say is not a delusion. 
It's a sacred disclosure of God's own truth, a truth come to earth through the gift of your speech. The question for us in this season from Pentecost and after is exactly for whom we will be people with tongues to speak and of equal importance, whether we will be the people with ears to hear. Amen.